This is the solutions video for problem set 14 for Kevin Ahern's BB450 slash 550 course at Oregon State University. In this problem set, I'll be working problems related to glycogen metabolism. The first question says that below are three different, it should be three different, and not difference, three different genetic diseases affecting glycogen metabolism enzymes. Based on the described phenotype, predict which enzyme is affected. Well, the first is described as Anderson's disease, and Anderson's disease is a disease in which there's a normal amount of glycogen present with long, unbranched chains. And of, cor chains. And of course, that last uh, piece of information is the most important consideration because uh, glycogen, of course, uh, normal glycogen, has branched chains. So we have to think then uh, about the enzyme that's involved in making uh, branched chains. And so we would expect that a person who has Anderson's disease would be, uh, be lacking the, in the enzyme known as branching enzyme. And of course, that is, the, in fact, the case. The second disease is Cori's disease. And it says that people with this disease have an increased amount of glycogen, um, but it has numerous short chains. And so here's also a clue to what's going on. Cori's disease, um, uh, the, the fact that it has numerous short chains suggests to us that this, ends, this uh, glycogen, the cell is unable to completely break down. And we remember that debranching enzyme is the enzyme that, of course, converts branched intermediates into linear chains during the process of glycogen um, uh, breakdown. So we would expect that if a, a cell were lacking in debranching enzyme, that it would not be able to convert those short chains so that when the glycogen got broken down, they would get stuck at a certain point and the phosphorylase would not be able to go any further. And consequently, the glycogen would be left with those little bitty short chains. And in fact, that's exactly what happens. So people who have Cori's disease are lacking in debranching enzyme. Now, McArdle's disease, the last one that's there, is the hardest one to figure out. And in fact, it's a, a little hard to figure out intuitively uh, what's going on. All that's given is that the people with this disease have a limited ability to perform strenuous exercise but otherwise, they're OK. Well, we have to think a little bit about what's involved in strenuous exercise. So in strenuous exercise, of course, the body um, is needing glucose as much as possible. And one of the sources of glucose is uh, that of um, glycogen. It turns out the people who have McArdle's disease are lacking glycogen phosphorylase in their muscles, and only in their muscles. If they were completely lacking in glycogen phosphorylase, uh, my suspicion is that they would probably not survive. Their liver, in this case, has normal glycogen phosphorylase and is able to break down the um, uh, glycogen that's there and provide it to the muscle cells via the Cori cycle. So it turns out that people with this disease, what they commonly see is that at first when they engage in exercise, they very, very rapidly fatigue, but after that actually catch up and, and feel uh, better after they've uh, started exercising a bit. And what we're actually seeing in people with McArdle's disease is, of course, the inability to get that immediate source of uh, glucose energy because of their inability to break down glycogen that's in their muscle cells. But when the liver gets the signal that the muscle cells are needing energy, they start breaking down glycogen using their functional glycogen phosphorylase, and they feed the muscle cells with the Cori cycle. So it's a very interesting uh, demonstration of the actual um, uh, Cori cycle and how a person might have a deficient glycogen phosphorylase and still be able to reasonably function. Question two says, another genetic disease affecting glycogen metabolism is that which results in an inactive G6Pase. The result of this disease is that the glycogen is found in increased amounts with normal structure. Explain why this is the case. Well, we think back, first of all, to what glucose 6-phosphatase, or G6Pase, um, is actually doing. G6Pase is the last enzyme in the pathway of gluconeogenesis. So liver cells, of course, perform gluconeogenesis and uh, supply glucose to the bloodstream through the Cori cycle, as we've talked about before. If a, a, a liver is lacking in, or a, a cell is lacking in glucose 6-phosphatase, what one might expect would be that glucose 6-phosphate would consequently accumulate. And when glucose 6-phosphate accumulates, what happens? Well, one of the things that can happen is, of course, that glucose 6-phosphate can be converted into glucose 1-phosphate. And glucose 1-phosphate can be converted into UDP glucose for the synthesis of, glu of glycogen. 
So consequently, if you were lacking in G6 uh, uh, PAs, that you would expect then that people who have this disease would have increased synthesis of glycogen because it's the cell's way of dealing with the excess glucose 6-phosphatase uh, that's abundant in these people who are unable to make glucose and gluconeogenesis. The last question says that the body's breakdown of glycogen is regulated by fast and slower regulation schemes. Describe this regulation and how the speed of its action is important physiologically. Now, I've talked about this in class, and I'll repeat it here. When we think about glycogen metabolism regulation, we think about two schemes. And specifically here, we're only talking about the breakdown of glycogen. The synthesis of glycogen is also tightly regulated, but that's not what the question is asking about. In glycogen breakdown, we have glycogen phosphorylase. And we remember that glycogen phosphorylase can exist in a phosphorylated form, known as GPA, and a dephosphorylated form called GPB. We remember that glycogen um, um, uh, phosphorylase A, the phosphorylated form, is stimulated by the binding of epinephrine and glucagon to the cell's surface receptor. And we remember that glycogen phosphorylase B is stimulated uh, to have the phosphate removed from GPA by action of binding of the uh, hormone uh, insulin. Now, the binding of a hormone to a cell is actually a relatively slow thing. The hormone must be synthesized, the hormone must travel through the bloodstream, the hormone must bind to the receptor, and then stimulate the process, the cascades that I've shown, going on inside of cells. Consequently, the, ex the conversion of GPA and GPB is relatively slow. On the other hand, the needs of the cell, especially if it's a muscle cell, are almost immediate. Because if a muscle cell takes off and starts contracting, let's say you go for uh, a sprint, the contraction is very quick, the need for ATP is very quick, and the source of ATP is the oxidation of glucose. So what happens then when a muscle cell starts contracting very quickly? Well, I've talked about a couple things in class that happened. One was the creatine phosphate reaction, in which creatine phosphate actually adds a phosphate onto ADP to make ATP. And that's one way to quickly make ATP. Another way to quickly make ATP is through allosteric regulation of glycogen phosphorylase. Remember that allosteric interactions happen instantaneously as molecules appear in the cell. Glycogen phosphorylase A is inhibited, that is, it's converted into the T state by the molecule glucose. So if a muscle cell is at rest, it's going to have a little bit of glucose present. It's going to have what little amount of glycogen phosphorylase A that's present binding to that glucose and existing in the T state. Similarly, when it's at rest, the muscle cell is going to have a fair amount of ATP and glucose 6-phosphate because it's not burning energy. And ATP and glucose, I'm sorry, ATP and uh, glucose 6-phosphate convert glycogen phosphorylase B into the T state also. So both forms of the enzyme are sitting there in the T state. And when a cell is at rest, both GPA and GPB are usually present. When the cell, when the body gets up and the muscle starts contracting, the first thing that happens is ATP gets, gets burned, and the cell starts making up that deficit by using glucose. The concentration of glucose in that muscle cell almost instantaneously falls. And as the instantaneous uh, fall of the glucose occurs inside of that cell, the glycogen phosphorylase A is converted from the B state, I'm sorry, from the T state back to the R state. Glycogen phosphorylase A now is very active. It starts breaking down glycogen. And that happens instantaneously. Similarly, if we look at what's happening in the cell, as ATP concentrations fall, the concentrations of AMP start rising. And AMP is a molecule that converts glycogen phosphorylase B from the T into the R state. So this is also happening very, very rapidly. It's an allosteric interaction with the enzyme. So in this case, we see both the glycogen phosphorylase B and the glycogen phosphorylase A converting very rapidly upon muscular contraction from the T state into the R state. Now, these are both happening before the hormone even arrives at the cell. So the hormone that would be released upon this would be epinephrine. 
if you have that grizzly bear chasing you that I've talked about in class so many times, that stimulates a fear response, which stimulates the release of that hormone, epinephrine, which now gets released into the bloodstream and travels through the bloodstream to the target cells to stimulate the conversion of glycogen phosphorylase B into glycogen phosphorylase A. That process is slow. The allosteric process is fast. The upshot of this is that the cell, in this case a muscle cell, has the tools available to it to very rapidly start breaking down glycogen as it is needed, even before the hormone gets there. 